Do you think that we that we're taught to learn to hate math? I think the way it's been taught has mm. led to that a lot because it's mm. it's time test. It's uh, you know a lot of memorization. A lot of uh, I've had I've taught teachers too. I used to work for the resource area for teaching mm. for nine years as their math specialist and American Institute of Mathematics with teachers and students. And at, I've done conferences as well with teachers. And I have found some that are really stuck in their way. They really want to, you know, you can't count on your fingers, they say, because that's just really, you know, that's wrong. You've got to memorize the whatever. And I go, what's wrong with counting on your fingers? I mean, it's fine. I mean, there's, if that helped you, then why not? You know, so there's different techniques that I think need to be revamped. And uh, a lot of people I know, like Joe Bowler and so forth, are doing Mm -hmm. a lot of work in this field. I really applaud them and you too, uh, in the educational field and just encouraging people to uh, really think outside the box or inside the box, which way should I go with you? (laughs) I'm going to ask you this question, Jeannie, because um, I actually, like, I'm curious what you think of this. So when you said counting on your fingers, I actually, to this day, I always count on my fingers, but I use a method taught by my grade three teacher, Cindy Penrose, called Chisenbop, where you can count to 100 on your fingers. Have you ever heard of that? Oh, I've, something I like use that. It, I use it all of the time. And it, it is like, it is literally one of my, I got, I honestly, I, there's, I, out of all the things I learned in school, that is one thing that I use all of the time, Chisenbop, right? Yeah. And, and like the the one thing I was thinking, you know, and like maybe this is going to turn into math therapy for me, kind of going through the process. <laughs> yeah, probably. I actually loved, I actually love the memorization. I love the time. I love, we did times tables. Yeah, um, I did when, we were, when we did like, you know, our, we'd go up to the board and our teacher say nine times seven. And I would like write it first. And if you like, <laughs> whoever like wrote it first stayed in the game until there was a champion. Right. And I yeah. love that stuff, the memorization. And I, from kindergarten to grade eight, I was considered so so good at math right i I was like one of the top students in in math and then in grade nine um i i I almost failed the class and i struggled throughout the process and i and like i'm thinking i'm thinking about this process and i'm thinking about um and and what your thoughts are on this because i felt that it'd be like the a lot of stuff that we were teaching was memorization was that and then as soon as it got to Hey, you have to think about this, and yes. there's like some problem. Then I was like, no, I, I, I'm out. Yeah. It, yeah. It's like in, as soon as it doesn't just come to me, yeah. then I struggle. Yeah. And so, like, is that like is that what happened there? Because like it, it was just it was surreal. Yeah, how much I loved math in grade eight, and how much and not like I love. I'll be honest, with you, I loved it because I was really good at it. Yeah. I, I like that's why I loved it. You're probably and then being- night. I hated it because yeah. it was just. It was like I didn't understand anything anymore. And I like, what do you think happened there? I think maybe, uh, did you feel like you were getting positive uh, reinforcement every time you won? You know, that's, that's kind well, of. Well, it, it was, it wasn't, it, it just, I could, it was like, it was like just something totally different. Yeah. Like it was like a, you know, I think uh, we, we went from like numeracy and then we went into more like, you know, uh, like oh, algebra, yeah. geometry and stuff like that. And it was just like, I don't, I don't understand anything anymore. Right. Like, and I felt like, oh, right. like I got to think this stuff out. Right. I, I was the kid notorious for, uh, hey, you need to show your work. I'm like, well, I know the answer. Why don't you show my work? Yeah. Yeah. Like, I already yeah. know how to do yeah. it. So it's just yeah. coming to me. And then once I actually had to show my work because I didn't know what I was doing, I was like, I don't want to show my work. I don't know what to do. <laughs> Yeah, right. I, I've had teachers like that and, and experiences like that. And also showing your work sometimes comes down to being either right or wrong, apparently, right, right. according to what the teacher wants. And it's like there's several ways to answer a question. Right. There's not just right. one. And I feel like uh, taking an open mind about it is really helpful to encouraging people to uh, really investigate further what is going on with the math. A sense right. of number is really important. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And a sense of why these things work and how they relate come better into focus, I think, when you have actual experiments and, and, mm-hmm. and things that you're doing that you see how it works um, and with really good analogies and so forth. So I, I find a lot of a lot of people really re- in my experience, that's really been a, a very positive thing is to have. Mm-hmm beyond memorization so the other question i gotta ask you is you 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 do a lot of work with new teacher new teachers entering the profession is that correct so okay so (laughs) like 
I uh, mean, I don't even know if I want to ask this question. Are like, are they all freaked out? Like, are they all like, oh, yikes, I don't, do I want to go into this? Like, what's, do you see a difference now of people entering the profession than you would maybe a couple of years ago? Like, what's the the perception as, as they enter the space? Because like you said, 2021 is like, I, I have the majority of people I've talked to over the last year have said, this is like the hardest year ever. And I don't think that's a, you know, like it's true, but I don't think people are like, oh, I can't wait to get into this profession. That's way harder than it was yeah. even when I first started, you know, going to college for it. Yeah, it's really interesting. I I feel like it's something that they don't want to talk about a whole lot, but I think right. that comes out in a little bit of tidbits. So I think for one example is that um, each of the student teachers that I'm seeing right now in my supervision and coaching is that they're extremely passionate for building relationships with kids. Right. And they are less focused on, I think, more of the instructional pieces but being there for kids and building relationships, which I have told them is, is that everything else can come next, just build relationships right. with kids. But at the same time, I tell them it's that you got to go to places. You got to be really strategic as a new educator. Nowadays, you got to be really strategic and where you want to go. What do you want to do? And create habits that you know for yourself could be sustainable, creating those right. personal boundaries. Like, for example, I always tell them, you know, fitness, like eat healthy, get enough sleep, right. um, possibly, I mean, talk to someone that's outside of your circle right. or, you know, it's, I, I think you have to have those supports in place. And to be honest, not everyone has those opportunities. And I, I, I just think that you have to have that support infrastructure around you to, and be strategic about where you want to go for you to be successful. And um, without that, then it's going to be, um, you're, you're going to be in trouble. And um, like I told the teachers last night in our session about digital portfolios and, you know, the hiring process is that you have the choice to pick, ask questions, look at, you know, I, I told them to ask about the master schedule. The master schedule is a bigger determinant of culture, I think, than most mm -hmm. of the items that you could ask someone. Look at how much prep time you have. Do they right. have PLCs? What, you know, those are really important questions. And I think that, you know, a lot of the teachers nowadays, if you're a teacher candidate right now, you should be the one interviewing the districts, interview the schools. That's, a, that's actually, like, I'm interested about that. And I don't know if that's a... The, the, and you're in, in uh, like Southern California, right? So yeah. like <laughs> when I first started teaching, <laughs> you took whatever job you can get. I, I know. Right. So I don't know, like, so I don't know if that's, you know, I, I know like you hear stuff about like the great resignation and like, that's not like if you, if you think that's just only happening in education, then you're in a bubble, right? Like it's happening in basically all professions. Uh, but the the reality of that is, uh, like, it, it, you think it's shifted that much where teachers actually, you know, coming into the profession have way more choice over the jobs that they take than when, when I first started? Oh, I think so. If you have specialized credential, these students have dual language. They can do Spanish oh, okay. and English. Then also special education. I think people that are going in is with special education. I mean, these are the two groups. You have the leverage. Ask the questions because those are what are needed. Right. and go somewhere that best suits you. And I think that's just for every teacher. I think that mm -hmm. um, depending on where you go, I mean, it depends. San Diego is a competitive market versus, for example, San Bernardino, California, or Visalia right. or Sacramento, right? But I mean, there's I mean, there's places where I know that they'll interview and they'll give you the job the, the next hour. So I mean, right. it's being strategic. And where do you want to end up? And do you want to be places where you know that you have an opportunity that they can sustain you and you have a great opportunity to, you know, grow and build relationships with the kids as well as the community there. So the, 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 and I appreciate that you're talking about like really kind of interviewing the district and, and how important that is as people are welcome into the profession. I think the other part of it too, like the, the district will, the district will tell you a lot about when you're leaving it too. Yeah. Well, and you can, you can actually be, uh, I, someone said this, that, um, and it wasn't an education, but it, it's so true that more people make decisions about the district or the area that they work in based not only not on the first three months, but on their last three months. And that's where they start doing that. Like what happens when they know you're leaving? How do they treat you? Mm -hmm. How do they connect with you? Right. 
And there is that there is that disconnect where people are like being treated extremely poorly. And you and you know, again, this is people, not systems. This is yeah. people like leading and creating systems. But the reality of this is you think, oh, well, this person is leaving. So like, what do I care how they feel when they're going? Well, that person's leaving and then they're going to talk to all their teacher friends and say how much your, your district sucks and how they yeah. treated you poorly. As opposed to like, make sure that when people are walking out that they are like, I, like, I think the best thing you can do as a district is make people like, like have like, you know, like regrets they're leaving because they just appreciate it so mm -hmm. much. Not like, oh, you're going to regret it. But like, but that idea is like, wow, like this is a place that I felt really cared for. And yes. this is a very tough decision because, you know, I don't know if I'm going to be feel this way because then you'll become even in your absence, you will become an advocate exactly. for that place. And I think that that's lost exactly. on a lot of people too, right? Yeah, I think that's a huge piece of the puzzle there. And, um, you know, if you empower someone to grow and learn and, you know, they're going to help your organization, your district, and then right. they're going to say great things about you in their right. next in their next stage. And that could, you know, be great for you. That could be great for recruiting people into your, right. into your district and school. And you, you want to be that and you want to have people have a good taste in their mouth when they leave. I, I guess kind of transitioning and, you know, to this idea, um, I know that you work with a lot of administrators kind of leading through this process and kind of trying to support them. So like, what are some of the, cause we can talk about like what went wrong, but I don't think that necessarily helps people move forward. What are some of the best things that you saw like administrators do during this time to like support their staff, to support the kids? What are some of the things that you saw through this process? We have been working with the district um, all year long and it has been a bumpy road because this has been a very difficult year. Um, and the yeah. and they're trying to make big changes and trying to do a lot of things at once. Um, and anyway, I think the best thing that the supervisor or the principals have done is put a pause on a bunch of stuff and say, yeah. Can we just hold on a second? Can we slow down, bump it back to every other week, slow, smaller bits? Um, and that's been very helpful for the staff and I think helpful for us too. So mm -hmm. I think that would be my example. I, and I love that. Shauna, what do you got? I was thinking of another, another school that we were working with that um, had done a grant last year. And so, you know, spent a whole year really invested in having their um, some key stakeholders within the district learning about mm. universal learning and then what they did this year was they said okay now we want to scale this but we want to be really intentional and I think uh, reasonable about it so they set up like monthly times with us that they could have some of their curriculum designers come in and share what they're doing and share some some sample lessons and just receive feedback and we would say hey you know here's some things to think about with universal design, but it was, it was, um, very manageable as far as the time. Like it wasn't, Hey, we're going to come in and, and give you all this information for a full day. It was really more, um, conversational and it, that happened after they had people really doing a lot of different things. So last year they did, some people did a book study. Some people came to sessions that were provided by our state. And, you know, some people worked with us and we did some sessions. So um, it was very individualized based on what they mm -hmm. they could manage last year. And then this year they kind of scaled it a little bit and they didn't bite off more than they could chew. And so um, I haven't heard yet yet if they're planning right. on scaling further next year, but I thought that was really um, that was really big to say we realized that the last last year and especially this year have been incredibly difficult. Let's not do too much. Yeah. And th this is like when when you talk about the the scaling process, right? I think and we we kind of talked about this in, in you know the the cohorts that we were working in together um a lot of times the there's a person who's like the curriculum specialist and blah 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 right and they almost create it where there's a dependence upon that person having knowledge and sharing that out as opposed to that person spreading that knowledge uh really empowering people that will never necessarily have that role but then that's how it spreads, right? So then you're kind of, and then there's this, there's this notion and it's like the li biggest lie ever. Oh, like, you know, you should be really good that you work yourself out of a job. If you're that good that you've built such capacity, people will continue to find other jobs for you. They'll never <laughs> like, oh, you know what? You are like so successful at this, but 
too successful. Now you're going to lose your job. They'll move you somewhere else. Right. (laughs) And so like that that building capacity is one thing. So I got to ask you this last question. So the the book is titled Havens of Hope ideas for redesigning education from the COVID-19 pandemic. How do you define the word hope? What a great question. Hope is active. Hope Mm -hmm. is creative. Hope is behaving in a way that creates the future that you want today. And that's what these programs did in their own small worlds. They created the environment that they wanted that didn't exist in the outside world and then worked to start to spread it. When you walk into these programs, you felt a lightness and a joy and a creativity when the outside world felt so heavy and frightening. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's, I think that's why I wanted to ask you this is because, and I really appreciate how you kind of articulated this is that the idea of like, you know, Oh, I hope I could win a million dollars. And it's like, you just hope some, like something will just hit you in the head, like an asteroid, you know, bringing you a million dollars. Whereas I see hope is, as you said, you know, something more active, something that you actually create. Right. Like I, I hope I can build this. Right. And so there is that hope there is that kind of vision, but it's, there, there, I think there's a difference between that idea of like just hoping but not doing anything versus hoping and actually moving toward that vision, right? And I think that's that's why I really appreciate what, what you're sharing. 